Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first masterclass for the year for Propreneur X. My name is Jay Sri Naidu, and I'm the CEO of YIDI, which is the Youth Innovation Entrepreneurship Design Institute. So this morning, we have a great program <coughs> for you. Uh, if I can please ask if any of you have your microphones on to please switch it off. I am going to be introducing the speakers. So welcome Ipaleng Makari and Nkuli Bakopa. Uh, please Nkuli, do switch your video on. If I can ask the participants for now to keep their videos off, we just want to prevent any lag on the system as well. Propreneur X is, an, is a development program and an accelerator for entrepreneurs servicing the property sector. And as such, from time to time, we deliver masterclasses to help grow and develop some of these entrepreneurs. We have a great alumni as well as an existing cohort, and I see some of them have joined us uh, on the line today. So welcome uh, entrepreneurs and alumni of the program as well. Before we kick off, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Let's start with our guest speaker and amazing fellow uh, innovator, as well as someone that's a professional in the property industry, Nkuli Bakopa. So Nkuli, first and foremost, is the Chief Operating Officer for Real Estate Investor Services at Broad Property Group which is Africa's leading real estate services company. But she's also the vice president of the Black Business Council and the founding member of the BBC's Women Alliance. And she is the past president of the South African Institute of Black Property Practitioners. So I'm sure you would agree we are in for an exciting morning with these powerful women within the property sector. And uh, I think Ipaleng also needs very little introduction to this community, but Ipaleng Makari is the CEO of Motseng Investment Holdings. She's also the SAPOA, South African Property Association's uh, past president and an existing board member and a trustee of the Women's Property Network Education Trust. Both these amazing uh, women have extensive experience in the property sector. And these masterclasses are designed so that we can give you as much input and insight into how to take your business to the next level with real experience from individuals that are in the space and working with entrepreneurs like yourself every day. And at one stage when Ipaleng was still running her CCTV business, she was an entrepreneur just starting off. So I know you in for an amazing journey with these uh, wonderful female uh, that we have in front of you. And it's Africa Day, hey Ipaleng. So it's indeed, also, indeed. <laughs> it's Africa Day, so what? better day to be having this conversation as well as we celebrate Africa Day and the power that exists within the African continent. So today's topic is about creating an ecosystem that supports the growth of entrepreneurs servicing the property sector. And Ipaleng, before we even get into this discussion, you know, I'd like to hear some of your views on what is an ecosystem and how can we expand the understanding of the ecosystem, especially for individuals that want to break into the sector? How do we do that? And how do we you know, just change the view of what an ecosystem looks like for the sector? Thank you so much, Reef, for that lovely uh, introduction. And thank you, Jayshree. I hope you can hear me clearly. We can. Thank you, Ipaleng. OK. Lovely. I, I was saying welcome to Nguli. Uh, it really is wonderful to have a fellow sister and uh, businesswoman in this industry uh, with us this morning. I think that an ecosystem, Jayshree, and to all of and welcome to all of our participants. Thank you for all getting up this morning and joining us. I think that an ecosystem is such an important um, definitional meaning to understand, particularly in business and in this property sector. I view an ecosystem in business 
as not just being the relationship between an entrepreneur and a client. Um, really, I think that the ecosystem that we see in the property sector is one that includes our industry associations. It includes academia uh, that particularly um, work in the property sector and allied industries. Um, it includes um, research houses. Um, it includes your key clients who are obviously your, your stakeholders. It includes a strong supplier base and partnerships. And, and so really when you begin to understand and all the professional bodies, because as you said in, in the beginning, Jay Shri, that uh, for instance, our guest today is a professional, she's an architect. Um, and it is very important to ensure that in a business, as you're running a business, that you really engage and understand what the full ecosystem is that surrounds your, your particular industry or sector. In the property sector, one of the things that I think we have been very, very um, blessed with is that we have got a thriving industry and very active industry associations that are there to support businesses, to assist to grow these businesses, networking and for engagement. Um, I was interested, in, interestingly enough, just yesterday, Jay Street, speaking to a young woman who's in a completely different sector, who said to me, you know, what's interesting, Ipileng, is here I am as an economist, and there is no such thing as an association of economists. So I have nobody other than the existing individuals in the industry to talk to. And I think that's something that is so important for our entrepreneurs here today to understand that you will not find relationships and opportunities in business just with your client base. You need to engage your ecosystem thoroughly uh, because people exist in so many different spaces and are influencing decisions at different levels. And that I think is, is a fundamental part of how we, we need to be able to understand that as, as, as business people and as entrepreneurs who are in the growth phase of our businesses. So thank you for that, Ipiling. Um, in Kuli, I mean, what are your views on the ecosystem? Because, you know, very often as entrepreneurs, we limit our view of an ecosystem just to the sector we're currently operating in. So although Brawl is playing in this property sector, the ecosystem that exists for entrepreneurs within the servicing the sector is much broader than just the property players. So I'd like to hear your views on the ecosystem in addition to what Ipiling has said. But also, I'd like you to touch on, you know, you engaging with these entrepreneurs almost on a daily basis that are approaching you for, you know, services or to be a supplier to an organization like Broad. You know, give me your views on the, the level of professionalism, the tenacity and the drive. You know, what do you want to see from these individuals and what haven't you been seeing? So over to you and Kuli. Thank you. Good morning, Jayashree and Ipiling and everyone on this call. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for your kind introduction. Um, so it's a loaded question. I think that uh, Ipiling has given us a very good idea of the entire value chain that one has to take into consideration when you are entering the sector. I think for me, what I love about real estate is that it's a sector that everyone engages with. So it doesn't matter if you are in the mining sector or in banking, financial services or in academia, actually, you know, so we all will engage with real estate. And I think that's how far you need to think about this ecosystem and this value chain, that it doesn't matter where you are, there's always an engagement with real estate, right? So as an entrepreneur, I think that one shouldn't limit themselves to purely property management services alone or property funds alone, but also spread themselves across the various sectors. Because in every single building around every four walls, you are going to have a plumbing problem. You are going to come across an electrical problem. You are going to come across uh, you know, the requirement of a project manager, you are going to come across the requirement for a cost uh, manager and a quantity surveyor and so forth. So I see, actually, I see our sector in everything in, in our everyday lives, you know, and I see that landscape as the opportunity that exists for each entrepreneur that is out there. 
I think that um, in terms of the value chain, it's also important to recognize other service providers, not just as a competitor, but as someone that you can collaborate with and find those opportunities for collaboration at all times. Um, but I also think that the networking opportunities that are presented by the associations, as Elaine has indicated, are not to be taken for granted. Building on those relationships and strengthening those relationships over the years uh, really does turn around into a net worth if you are conscious and deliberate about it. So making sure that you take advantage of the industry associations and participate and get, us, get yourself involved as far as you can. So I think um, I, I can attribute my own success to, to actually having leveraged such platforms, right? Um, so with respect to what I'm not seeing enough of from the entrepreneurs, um, and you see it in other segments and you don't see it in other segments. I think uh, for lack of a better word, it's the aggression, you know, uh, and, and how one asserts themselves confidently about their product or service offering, whatever it is, knocking down those doors and making sure that you are remembered, right? So if you are going to reach out to an entity, someone in procurement or someone in my position, for instance, and send your company profile via email and think it's been read, uh, well, think again. You know, just this morning I was cleaning out my mailbox it was so full and i'm thinking to myself but like every week it's the same you know so mailboxes get full and people have one email after another after another so always follow it through with the phone call always follow it up with i'd like facetime you know uh, always follow it up with i'd like to present my solu solution to you and uh, and make sure that you keep you, you stay top of mind and follow it up every three months if you have to, you know, but I find that um, most entrepreneurs think that it's enough that I've sent my company profile, they've got it in hand, and so it's enough, you know, so I think there's always more that one can do, definitely. Thank you so much for that, Inkuri. I mean, you know, something simple like, uh, you know, when I switch to gallery view, I see some individuals have their logos, you know, on, and others just have their names. So use every opportunity, I think, to professionalize your business and, you know, just how you appear to others as well. So that's great input. Now, Ipiling, you know, in all of the leadership discussions that we've had uh, as the ProPremier leadership team, you know, we've always had entrepreneurs and discussions around funding. Now, I would like to hear your views on what type of funding support do you think entrepreneurs in this space actually need? And let's also start unpacking, you know, what are these non-traditional funding instruments that exist? And it's a conversation, you know, we often shy away from because Propreneur X is not a funding program, but we want to ensure that entrepreneurs are able to access the funding they need when they need it. So I'd like us to have a conversation around this. And in Kuli, um, I'd also like you to come in on this point as well. So Ipeleng, maybe your views on funding and what's out there. Yeah, thank you, Jay Shri. I think that it's one of the most challenging uh, conversations to have because as we sit right now, um, I think that the funding challenge has just quadrupled for businesses post COVID. Um, and businesses that we have to acknowledge. Um, some people have had to close their businesses, slow down their businesses, reduce what they're doing or pivot. And in all of that, funding is central. And, and I want to highlight really what I believe as, as funding. So if you're in a business and you're running a business today, you've started already. Um, you probably have a number of clients uh, or a key client and you're servicing that particular entity. And usually the greatest challenge, Jayashree, is cash flow. Um, I don't think that many of our businesses are short of the ability to get an opportunity. Um, but once they receive the opportunity, it is there that challenges do come in. Um, and, and it is there that they can reach um, real complications because um, either they need to be able to start a project, um, they need some kind of startup funding, to, to getting a project going, 
equipment, services, whatever it might be. Um, there are a number of solutions in the market. Um, and I think that it's important. I've certainly realized even in my own business, even when we are a business that's been around for 23 years, that you do need to look beyond the traditional funding houses. So when I say traditional, the beyond the traditional banks that are retail banks that also have commercial elements. I mean, not to say that they're not there to provide, but I think that most entrepreneurs need short to medium term funding to fix gaps in their cash flow issues. Um, and you would find that there are uh, companies that provide a, a range of services, invoice discounting, for instance, um, a number that may also look at grant funding, particularly enterprise supply development funding solutions. Grant funding is not big. So most entities don't fund more than a million rand, but they may, that may just be what you require as a, as a small business to get going. Um, that funding is difficult to obtain, Jayshree, if you don't have everything uh, you know, in hand, compliant and, and ready to go. Um, and, and obviously ESD suppliers or ESD funding, let me say, is quite the thing in South Africa based on our triple BE um, codes. Um, so you need to do your research as, as entrepreneurs and identify who are those established ESD funding houses? What do they provide? What do they require from you? I think that typically when you look at the funding gaps that we're talking about, many of our suppliers and our participants and beneficiaries are entities that are typically EMEs. So that's an entity that in the codes, it's anything from turning over 500,000 to let's say 10 million rand. For you to be able to operate as an EME, you have leverage that you are able to utilize. Um, sometimes even your client can ensure that they pay you early on time to gain points in terms of your EME status. So there are different ways, I think, of gaining funding or gaining early cash flow or better cash flow solutions. Um, maybe Guli will touch on some of the challenges where beneficiaries or suppliers um, want to be pre-funded by clients. And that can be quite a challenge um, and can actually create a bit of an off-putting uh, situation at times. My apologies, I don't know how I switched off my video. Um, and so I think, you know, Jayshree, that um, focus really for me around that EME um, proposition is very important to understand and leverage and to be able to get to the QSE level and beyond. Thank you yeah. so much for that. Uh, so if I may add, yeah. With respect to funding uh, for, for SMMEs, I feel very strongly around the question of collateral. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an often misunderstood concept by many of our SMMEs and yet such a crucial one and such a critical one um, that they leave out and yet it's the biggest lever that makes funding available to SMMEs. So I gave the example about speaking to a young group of, of, of people and advising them to say, uh, at this age, uh, if you are going into entrepreneurship, do consider making sure that your credit score, your personal credit score uh, is clean and it's, it's what is desirable by any bank. And over and above that, try to make sure that you look for a property. Even if you're still staying at home, make sure that you get a property for investment purposes. And above all, as a young person who might only still be acquiring your very first property, there's many opportunities around subsidies that are available at the various banks that you need to find out about and be able to take advantage of. So with that said, then you are able to tick the box of collateral. And once you do, the banks are more amenable when you make funding applications and um, you are also able to, to, to make sure that you have an asset that you can use to leverage. I think with respect to the broader funding landscape, entrepreneurs should always be on the lookout for grant funding that is available. Sadly, we don't have a very strong seed funding capital base in South Africa as exists in other countries. Um, and yet we put ourselves as a country that, you know, that wants to emp empower entrepreneurs. But there are those pockets of funders that are available. And I think 
to Ipiling's point, she may have mentioned the CIFAs of this world, the SASFINs of this world, and also just ESD programs that exist within each and every single South African bank that I don't think is adequately tapped into by our entrepreneurs. So I think that they should go into that space and make those investigations, even with their business bankers uh, within the various banks. Up front, I think that many of the uh, entities that I have come across that are running such incubators are actually quite empathetic and they are quite supportive to the entrepreneurs that are coming through. But I think the message I just want to land is in my talking to the young people, I specifically said, make sure your credit score is right. After that, make sure you get collateral. There's never, you're never too early to buy a property, never too late, you know, and it could be any property anywhere. Uh, just obviously you need to put those fundamentals right in place, but it starts with that property ownership. And once you've got that, I think it makes, it paves the way and it makes it easier. And that communication when you get started and not just, not just um, going through it on your own without understanding the landscape that Ipileng has painted of the grants that are available, the subsidies that are available. Um, you know, obviously we don't want you to go and get a loan that is going to eat away at the profitability of your business because then it makes it unsustainable, you know? Uh, but also, um, and I, I don't wanna take it for granted that entrepreneurs uh, understand how to manage finances. Now I'm no bookkeeper myself, I'm no accountant myself, you know? So we need to appreciate that when you start a business, you feel like you should be the everything, the be all and end all of this business. You're the founder, you're the CEO, now you're running the HR, now you're the CFO, now you're the, you know, you're the bookkeeper on top of that. So finding those correct professionals to help you and make sure that your business is being run efficiently and how to manage your books will go a long way. And I think that sometimes we take it for granted and think we are very small. So when we grow, we'll find these people, right? But I think it's, it's in managing those rands and cents uh, so that we are able to build up to those millions. And, and, and we will indeed, yeah. Thank you so much, Nkuli. And your passion definitely shines through for equipping these individuals with the knowledge that they need. If you've just joined us, we are halfway through the masterclass for ProPreneur X. Please use the chat function if you have any questions that you would like to direct to either Ipaleng Makari or Inkuli Bakopa, and we will direct those questions to them. Later on, we'll also allow you to unmute and ask your questions directly. Um, you know, Inkuli, you've touched on a couple of very, very important points. You know, the need for compliance, the need to get all your paperwork in order. And I think we touched on this, you know, when we were preparing for this discussion, you know, the need to be what we refer to as shelf ready and pulling in like a board of directors to help you grow your business and seeing the importance of those type of structures, you know, everything from human resources to compliance. And I think very often as, under, as entrepreneurs, we underestimate how important these, uh, you know, simple pieces of papers are, especially to large organizations. And I remember a little while ago when we had to submit for a piece of work with one of the financial services institutions, there were 27 different pieces of compliance papers that we needed. Everything from SLAs to tax clearance, and you don't realize the importance of getting all of that in order. So if we really want to shift EMEs to QSEs, you know, we've got to get entrepreneurs to understand the importance of getting all of this in place as well. So Ipiling, uh, you know, over the years, you partnered and collaborated with several organizations and individuals, so much so you often call me Marlene. I love it because it means he's on top of mind. <laughs> So in Kuli, if you're a bit confused yesterday when Ipaleng called me Marlene, Marlene is one of Ipaleng's new business partners. I think we look very similar because uh, she's on I'm top sorry. of mind with Ipaleng. <laughs> so Ipaleng, you know, talk to me about, um, you know, your views on the power of collaboration and the value of it. And why do you think it's so important 
for entrepreneurs to take this really, really seriously. Malini, I am going to use myself as an example. When I started as a, my apologies, Jay Shree. You see now, Jay Shree, you did, you did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Shree, I take this, I'm going to use myself as an example because when I started um, in business, I was very uh, focused and gung-ho on being the entrepreneur and building myself as a business as an, and as a brand. And I think, Jayshree, what I lost the opportunity of doing early on, but I realized as we grew, is to acknowledge actually that every single competitor uh, is a potential partner. And, and I say that with, with every bit of understanding of business 23 years later, you, you have to be able to recognize that an ecosystem exists. And for an ecosystem to exist, the, the reality is that as business people, I need to be able to bring what I can bring to a partnership. And it is possible that a competitor is actually able to walk a road with me for a particular project. It is not always the case that it obviously will be successful. But I think that the first order of business for me today is to say to entrepreneurs, do not see another competitor, same size, maybe even bigger than yourselves, as a threat to you all the time. See them as an opportunity provider, but you need to be able to obviously identify what it is that you can put on the table. Um, if I hadn't recognized, if we as a team, I think, hadn't recognized that probably in the first 10 years of our business, we probably would not be here still today because partnerships have been the making of a sustainable business. Um, when you look at every single part of our business, we've not been able to grow into new sectors within the property sector without being able to partner with others. Um, I think also what is absolutely critical, Jay Shri, is that business has become harder apart from just compliance. Clients actually don't want to, to think about the things that we want to bring to them. They want specialists. They don't just want generalists. They want individuals and companies that can bring them interesting data, important information. If you are unable or if your business is not necessarily inclined, let me take a simple example. You are providing a cleaning service. What is the, uh, the opportunity in environmentally friendly solutions that you can research either through academia or through partnerships, through industry associations that you can bring to bear in the right partnerships in your business? How do you present that differently without necessarily being seen as another cleaning service business. And, I, and, and whoever is in the cleaning industry, please know that I, I have huge respect for what you're doing. What I'm really saying is what differentiating factors do partnerships bring? Huge differentiating factors, if you are actually willing to understand and unpack them. And I think that it is that that clients are looking for. I also think that the partnership element, and I recently learned this, that as you are growing in your business, um, we all know that our clients are not just our clients. Our clients are human beings. They are potential partners. You want to move from just being a service provider to a client to being an advocate of your client. For your client seeing you as a partner that actually is an advocate for them. And so when you think about partnerships, not just the external partnerships you have with competitors, it is the partner you see in your client. And, and that is fundamental because they themselves have depth in being able to allow your business to grow. Absolutely. You make such, you know, powerful points there. I mean, Propreneur X is, is a perfect example of a partnership because, you know, it is sponsored by Kakiso Trust, but supported by Motseng and Sastek, the Supplier Diversity Council. And it's players within the ecosystem that have come together to put the entrepreneur at the center. And that's what makes a model like that powerful because you've got your funding partner, you've got your sector partner, you know, you've got your access to networks partner and your development partner, all trying to work together. And, you know, I really appreciate the examples you've shared because this is the power of partnerships that we want entrepreneurs to see. And, you know, in a previous masterclass we hosted earlier this year, a, gen a general masterclass, uh, you know, the, the keynote speaker, York Zuki, touched on something that you've just touched on as well, is that people do business with people. 
uh, you know, and we often want to say we're working with the company, but we're actually working with the person within that company. So you've actually got to see that relationship grow and nurture that relationship because they become your biggest fans and, you know, your spokesperson and your ambassador. And that's what we need, especially as growing businesses in the sector. Now, in Cooley, um, you know, Brawl is a national company. And many of the entrepreneurs on the line with us, you know, often go first for the big metropolitan areas to try and get work in that space. And it is a space that's really, really saturated, as we've discussed. You know, it was uh, saturated before, and now with all of the focus being placed from an ED and ESD perspective, there's more entrepreneurs that want to just come into these big metros. So what are your thoughts and what's your advice on localization and how we can get entrepreneurs to see the value and the power of thinking local? Thanks for that question, Jayshree. Um... I think that when I raised the issue, it was because I see a lot of saturation, of, as you've put it, you know, in the center. So I'm saying there are plenty of opportunities that our entrepreneurs miss uh, when they don't go to the local area, you know. And when I say local area, in my uh, instance, I'll be referring to the shopping malls that we have, that we manage uh, across the country, right? So um, it's always a missed opportunity when the entrepreneur doesn't start at the center management office and ask to meet with the operations man manager or the general manager at the center and present themselves. I think that's a missed opportunity because even at a center management level, they are desperately trying to find service providers that are around them that can respond timelessly um, and where they are able to have an engagement and see what their service levels are, you know, rather than being dictated to from a head office level to say use supplier X and they've never experienced them. So I think that entrepreneurs shouldn't miss the opportunity to go local and make sure that they present themselves locally. I cannot overemphasize presentation. Uh, and when I say presentation, I mean, you know, your, your corporate identity your company documentation, how you present yourself and your service offering, it's so critical. It's like when you are carrying yourself into an interview, of course you want to make sure that that first impression lasts. And I think uh, one other point I'd like to make was, uh, I was quite impressed by a gentleman who found me and made contact with me and said, I live close to shopping center X. And this shopping center I've observed how the waste is being managed. I'm a waste entrepreneur and we convert waste to energy and we convert waste to X, Y, and Z. And I think that there is an opportunity. So I've observed what's going on in your mall around me and I can see the gap as well as see the opportunity. And this is what I would like to present to you. I think that that's the additional value that service providers and entrepreneurs should bring to the table where these, these properties are close to them. They are there every, every other weekend uh, experiencing the mall. See where those gaps are. And when you come up to someone at a procurement level or someone in my office, for instance, you are able to say, this is the gap that I found. This is the solution I'm here to present to you. And that immediately differentiates you from one service provider to another. So I think that it's it's hugely important, uh, Jayshree, that we do try and look at localization and service those areas that are less desirable and less serviced. I mean, we've got, you know, a lot of shopping centers and funds that are moving towards rural and township developments. So we shouldn't see opportunity purely when it's sitting in the in the suburbia, you know, but see it uh, for what it is in our local areas. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, uh, Nkuli. And Ipaling, um, I see we've got a hand up as well. We are going to move over to the participants in the next two to three minutes. So Ipaling, what are your views? I know you have some strong views on localization as well. And, you know, uh, do you have <laughs> any examples of, you know, individuals that have really managed to get this right? So I think, Jayshree, that I've, I've come to 
understand and really appreciate this concept of localization for, for what it is. Essentially, when you think about it, multiple uh, sustainable centers that look like Gauteng across the country is actually what South Africa needs. And when Guli talks about real estate being at the center of everything that we do, um, you can begin to extrapolate and understand how powerful that concept is. So if you're in Pumalanga right now, or if you're a service provider and, as, and, and have a company that could provide a service in Mpumalanga region, why is it that you would be trying to compete with um, a very saturated Gauteng environment? And these are the questions that we need to ask ourselves. Um, we do understand that typically most uh, entrepreneurs believe that Gauteng is where the gold sits. But when you listen to what Guli has just described, a company such as Bro is represented nationally and represents their clients nationally and, and therefore are desperately looking for professional teams um, and that understand the work ethic that is required to be able to operate in other centers. And I, and I can only encourage um, you know, every single entrepreneur on the call here today to really look at their business and to really understand what could we do um, outside of where we are in, in Gauteng uh, or in the, 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 the general area around us? What, actu what actual service could I take elsewhere? When you say, Jayshu, what have I seen in my own business? I, I think that we have been very much focused on, on Gauteng as a business over the years. We've gone into other countries, but I think that what we haven't done well, and I have to be honest, is to really establish ourselves better in other regions. And so I'm taking up the call that Nguli is saying herself, whilst we, whilst we have managed centers in different regions, what I can take out of it as Musing is that I see the value in actually being able in this particular environment, we can work from anywhere as business people. Um, and really, I think it's the value of understanding the power of where you come from and, and the power of the relationships that you have. So to Kuli's point, not only are uh, industry associations um, local, they are also national. So please understand how a CYBIB, a SAPOA, any of the industry associations could assist you in being able to understand simple thing, who exists where, property funds themselves. And I want to really just make this point. Any business that is in a South African or global environment operating in a very professional way in, the, in these environments, there is a thing obviously called ESG. Uh, and I think that the whole focus on ESG for most businesses doesn't just want to focus on what profits are actually being gained at the center, but they want to focus on what development and what sustainability exists wherever we operate. And so if you understand that about a mining house, or if you understand that about a property fund, they want to be able to reach out further where they actually are operating. That's the power in what an entrepreneur, such as the ones that are on the call, actually can begin to um, unpack for themselves and strategize with their teams to say, how do we take this further, um, you know, in terms of the localization conversation. Thank you so much, Ipeleng. So I'm going to open up to the participants now for questions. I see we already have one that I'm going to be directing to Nkuli. I've also put on the chat, please feel free to share your company details, your contact details, what do you do, so that everyone on the call can also have sight of your business and maybe there's an opportunity to already connect to a fellow entrepreneur or someone that you may need for your business. So in Kuli, the question we got from Kahiso is um, regarding uh, sourcing locally, especially in the township. Does Brawl empower center managers to source their own service providers? So over to you, Nguli. Hi, Jeshri. Thank you for the question posed around whether Brawl does empower the center managers to source their own service providers. The answer is definitely yes. I did post this on the chat group earlier, and I indicated that it's yes. However, we still expect that they would use the vendor database that is available to the group, which is a, a central vendor database. This enables us to make sure that we tick all the compliance boxes, but also it's a system that we use for payments as well. So it's a full on system that allows for procurement and payment of service providers. So while they can make a decision based on 
localization, which we encourage completely because then the, there's a quicker turnaround time and the service providers that are localized will understand better the challenges and the gaps that exist and present better opportunities to the center managers. Sipo, I see you have your hand up. You are welcome to unmute and ask your question. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my question uh, is straight to Sister Nkuli. Uh, I wanted to Wonder Park, Wonder Park Mall to ask her how can I do electrical services in the mall. So they told me to register with Vantage Brawl. So I went, I went online and I registered with uh, Vantage, uh, yeah, Vant uh, for portal, again, Brawl portal. So since I have registered, my information is still saying modified, uh, waiting, waiting for, for, waiting for approval. So I was asking her, how can I make follow up? Because uh, it has been more, more than two months now. I'm waiting for approval from the portal brawl site. So is there a way maybe I can, uh, or what should I do? Because uh, I, I, I've been told or, uh, to find myself doing uh, those electrical services in the malls. I need to register with Brawl Vantage. So I took that, that step, but now uh, I'm still waiting for approval. Or is there any other way maybe I can find my profile under under Brawl? Thanks. Thanks so much, Sipo. Nkuli, let's try again if you want to respond to that uh, vocally, or if we struggle, we'll get you to respond on the chat. Okay, there we go. Uh, thank you for that question, Sipo. Um, I've just provided my email address. We do have people, a team that is focused on, uh, on assisting our suppliers when they do struggle with raw advantage. And um, you know, it's a portal that has been found to be very useful for our procurement, uh, for enabling payments when you are done with your work. And we do recognize that some of the suppliers do need to be onboarded and it's not as seamless as the system has been designed, but I'm happy to take an email from you and I can make sure that I pass it on to, to my Brawl Vantage team. And um, I think in responding to the previous question, I did indicate that, yes, it's important to register onto a central database because of compliance and making sure that we are able to process your payments when you are done, even though at a center management level, they may be empowered to engage with you directly. They cannot forego uh, going through that central database and making sure that they follow through on the compliance aspect. Yes. Thank you so much for that, Nkuli. Um, if there are any other questions from the uh, participants, please do raise your hand and we will uh, address that to the speakers we have today. So Ipaleng, uh, how do individuals engage with Motseng if they need to? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jayshree. So we essentially have a procurement team. If you, I think there's an address that's procurement at Motseng. I'm going to have to double check that but i.co.za, and I would like to suggest that um, once we have your information, we will then also share with our um, multiple GMs. Um, we have a couple of our Propreneur X teams that have been able to, Jayshree, I think, get some uh, small contracts, painting work contracts, cleaning contracts, um, and I want to encourage them that whilst we may not have a national portfolio, um, certainly we will make sure that we are able to also share your, your profiles with, within our team and also within other individuals that we might know in the industry. Um, so the one thing I wanted to mention, I think there's a gentleman called Abela Mishamakulu who runs a cleaning business, who He's has been engaging, well. <laughs> lovely, who has been engaging me and, and I've uh, certainly suggested to Avela that he contacts also some of the, the other um, entities in the industry and I'm grateful that Nguli has put up her her, her email, and I would encourage someone like Avela to follow the process that the other gentleman, Mr. Mashango, also followed. Um, I think that one of the things, uh, Jayshree, that is time consuming, but very uh, important, is that if we have 10 or so large or even more property businesses in the industry, get onto every single procurement database, make sure that your company is registered there. Make sure that, as Sipo has just said, you follow up you know who the procurement teams are, you follow up even with the center managers. I think that there is huge value. Sometimes it's slow with responses. And so 
with Sipo's comment and point, it's important to understand that there are hundreds and thousands of service providers doing exactly what you're doing. And so your follow up, your insistence, developing a relationship eventually with the receptionist is actually something that's important because finally you will get an opportunity and may actually be requested to come and register and, and respond to an RFP or something. Um, some of the bigger corporations um, that are outside of the industry, um, specifically if I think of entities such as your uh, mining houses, your um, uh, fuel um, retailers, the shells and so forth, a lot of them have centralized online systems. You will never get to speak to a procurement person really. You're speaking to an Oracle system and you put in your information. That too requires somebody to be in control of it in your company. If it is you, because I know as a startup, sometimes you are everything. If it is you, make sure that there is your email address and another email address that should you not be available um, that can pick up uh, on these uh, responses. Because what I found is often the things fall in the cracks because these big corporations are just ch ch churning out emails to the database. And if you're not responsive, you will lose out. Um, um, and, I, and I think that that's just a comment, a general comment, Jayshree, around how to interact, excuse me, with medium-sized entities and large global groups. Um, it, there, is a, there, is a, there is a science to it, or at least a, a way in which it needs to be done professionally. Thank you so much, Ipaling. And I mean, you know, they are, like with the South African Supplier Diversity Council, use that as a platform to register your business because there's opportunities. There's a central supplier database, you know, for government type opportunities. Because if you do come across a, an RFP that's going to link to your business, you're going to have to be registered. So rather register on these platforms in advance so that you can bridge any gaps that you identify prior to an opportunity coming up and then being delayed because you don't have your paperwork in order. So do take heed you know, to the advice from uh, Ipaleng and Nkuli throughout the session, some brilliant pieces of advice. Think local, think about localization, think about the opportunities, um, you know, approach organizations with a need that needs to be fulfilled, like Nkuli's example of the waste management uh, provider use every opportunity to professionalize your business. And that goes from you know, having your paperwork in order to having all of your branding, your marketing, your logos, your professional profiles, so you can leverage these opportunities. Don't underestimate the value of professionalization even within this industry. So we do some you know, secret shopping with some of the entrepreneurs on our programs in the early days. And we then give them inputs into why you shouldn't show up without a pen and paper and a measuring tape and a calculator. It's the simple things that will set you up for failure. But if you are growing from an ESD to a QSD as well, like in Cooley advised, have the basics in place, like your board of advisors, your human capital processes and practices. If you don't, you're setting yourself up for failure as you grow your business. So we've come to the end of the session. I see there aren't any other questions or we have one question from uh, Sissi Kalele. Uh, please unmute and ask your question and then we'll uh, do closing remarks from Ipaleng and from Nkuli. Um, Sissi Kalele, you're welcome to ask your question. Uh, thank you so much, Jayfree. Um, Am I audible? Yes, you're very audible, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much to all the other speakers uh, for a very insightful presentation today. Uh, quite a lot to take away from it. Um, thank you for that. I think my question uh, is directed to Mr. Simkari. Um, I I'd like to know, um, I'm Masigi, obviously from Invero Studio. We are an architectural company that's been running for about six years now, operating around Gauteng. Um, we do have a couple of jobs around the Eastern Cape as well. Uh, mostly servicing uh, property funds and we do the residential market as well. Um, so my question is, it's, it's one thing to be able to get onto databases and um, get to um, secure some contracts, especially with the big companies. And this is some of the experiences that we've gone through um, with maybe just one of the big pharmaceuticals uh, within the country as well. We often find that as um, an SMME, you actually coming from a position of vulnerability 
whereas in, in negotiating a contract itself alone is, 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 is a bit of a steep hill in terms of um, the terms and conditions that you have to sign into. Um, you find that um, you often get payment terms which are not favorable to a small business, for instance, where you have to wait for about um, a whole month, which is 30 days in order for your invoices to get paid and all of that. So my question is, how do you um, negotiate yourself into um, a favorable position, but at the same time, trying to humble yourself as someone who wants to gain experience um, within the property industry? Um, is, is there any advice that you could probably give us in terms of navigating those um, rough waters um, to, to still try and keep an amicable relationship with your client, but still try and stick within their terms and conditions, but make it favorable for yourself as well? Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much for that question. Ipa Ling, can you respond? I'd love to. So, you know, I, I, I really do think that um, this concept of understanding where your business is, and, and I'm not sure if uh, if your business is an EME or a QAC, but there are benefits um, that you can leverage in negotiating with your client um, at that level. And let me give you an example. Um, most uh, companies, um, certainly if they have, you know, clear procurement policies, um, are able to use the, the codes of good governance uh, on the, in the property sector charter council, the property sector codes, where you are able to understand, and you should really please understand, guys, what are the, the actual opportunities that an EMU or QSC has in engaging with the client. So one of them is, for instance, payment terms. Um, payment terms can be negotiated with your client where you are saying to them, I am, I've registered on your database. Um, I now have a contract with yourselves or we've got a PO to do work and an award. Um, I am an EME and I've registered as such. And, and as an EME within this particular sector, we are able to get um, specific uh, benefits um, such as early payment advices. Um, you know, you, you should be able, for instance, not to wait 60 days or 45 days for a payment. It does depend on what sector codes obviously your client operates in. So it does become important for you to understand that as well. So understanding our codes of good governance and why we are registered as EMEs or QSEs is important because it can allow you to have those kinds of conversations. In terms of contract negotiation outside of the payment terms, which is a very big part of it, obviously, I think that there's a lot of jargon and a lot of information that you do need to understand. And I think as an architect um, with each of these different services, whether it's a professional service or a general service, you, you, you really do need to understand the SLAs that you're signing up into or signing up for um, and be, begin to, I suppose, assess Sisikelele, the risks that you are able to take on. So there are risks that will potentially be far bigger than what your business could actually adopt. Um, and, and that's a process that you need to assess as you look at an SLA. So I would, I would encourage you as business people, we all are aiming to get the PO, we're all aiming to get the contract award. I would encourage you, when you bid for some of these bids, often in the RFPs, if it's an RFP or a government tender, they actually provide the contract that you're going to be signing sometimes. Um, and it's important for you to get in and understand what that contract says. If they don't, even if it's a normal private client, please ask for it. Because I think it's in your interest to be able to understand what the terms and conditions are. I see that Nguli has her hand up and she may have a lot more to add than I on this subject. I hope I've been Over to you, Nguli. Uh, yeah, so if you like, just to the point that you've made around contracts. So I'm reminded about the conversation we had about setting up a board of directors, you know? So whether it's a formal setting or not formal, I think surround yourself with those professionals that can help you. So in the uh, process of going through a contract, do you have in your circle a legal person that you can refer to, you know? And I think that as a, as a company grows, it's so critical to make sure that you 
set up the for lack of a better word, I'll call it a board. Uh, but it's it, it's those people, it's those people who will support your business and help. And it's those people that might have even broader networks than what you do, you know, and have probably walked this road before you. So I think that it's important to surround yourself uh, with at least six people. And I as it has to have when you are running a business, you almost have to be an all-rounder and we know that it's impossible. So find those specialist skills and make sure that you have people with knowledge that you can tap into. And I see that my CEO is also here. Malcolm, I'd like to mention around how you can participate on Brovantage. Uh, and to the point that Elaine made media around ESG comments, it's a that more and more, you know, transformation and diversity is, is key in the sector. And the property sector codes are pushing companies and funds to make sure that they comply. So don't take for granted that the sector is looking for capable entrepreneurs like yourselves to come through and show up. So in Kuli, I think, you know, I think Kuli got cut off. So apologies, in Kuli, uh, we were experiencing some real bad lag on her side. But we will get that feedback from Nkuli um, in writing. When we share the recording, I will make sure that we send that through. I don't want you to miss any of the nuggets of wisdom that she had to share. Malcolm, welcome on board as well. I see you've put a really great message of motivation and information on the chat as well. And Nkuli has responded to some of the other comments on the chat as well. We're gonna take a last question or comment, Avela, if you can please keep it as short as possible. And then we're gonna do closing comments uh, from Ipaleng and if Nkuli joins us again. So over to you, Avela, you can unmute and then we'll close off the session. All right, um, firstly, good morning, everyone. I hope I'm audible. You are, Avela, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jeshri. A big thanks to, on behalf of every Propenu X for organizing such a session. And uh, thank you so much to our speakers today, um, Ipeleg and Guli. And um, just a, a comment um, regarding today's meeting is that really, um, I think as small business people, um, such uh, initiatives and such meetings, they really do encourage us and they really um, ignite the vision that we have to see um, two gorgeous women who have worked so hard and to be where they are. And for us, it's just a matter of, you know, working hard and, and, and also learning from, from, from where they come from. And I think a comment that uh, Nkuli made was to be aggressive. <laughs> I think as she's mentioned, um, I've tried to be aggressive and, and I think I totally agree, I agree with you, Nkuli, is, is sometimes as small businesses, we need to be aggressive. And, and, and it helps us because once we become aggressive, the advice that we get from the meetings that we, we have with you people and, and, and every successful individual, uh, it, what's important is that we, we take, we take what, what we've been um, fed and begin to utilize it. And I remember um, the meeting I had with Ipe Leng a while back is that some of the things she'd advise us to do and we've started uh, doing them in our businesses and we are seeing fruits bit by bit. So what I'm trying to say is these sessions for some of us, we don't take them very lightly uh, because they've really, really been informative. They've really assisted us. And, and I think it's important for everyone that whatever we take today, um, just to browse through it and, and, and begin to start to practice because the little things um, that really assist us um, to be where we want to be. But I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to be part of this program and I see growth and I've seen growth and uh, thank you so much. I hopefully we'll have more of these, um, J3. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Avila. And, you know, um, thank you to all of the Propreneur alumni as well as existing entrepreneurs. Thank you for your resilience, you know, in these difficult times. And to all of the other participants that have attended and are working in the space, we wish you all the best, you know, in your journeys as well. So, Ipaleng, closing comments from you and Nkuli, if you are on the line as well. I see your name here, but I'm not sure if you're on the line with us. But Ipaleng, over to you for some closing comments and remarks. Thank you, Jayshree. Um, it's been a really wonderful morning. And I'll tell you what I think I'll, I've taken away from today is the fact that um, it is a, during times uh, as difficult as these um, that entrepreneurs really do need to engage um, and start to talk to one another um, and share some of their challenges. Just today, we've seen a couple of individuals who are entrepreneurs asking simple questions, but that are so important to their business, to getting an answer, getting clarification. I really applaud you for asking those questions um, and for engaging with us. The journey of an entrepreneur, Jayshree, is a very long one. It's a difficult one. It's not a sexy road. And I always want to remind entrepreneurs about that. So stay resilient, stay focused, um, keep knocking on those doors. It, it doesn't mean that they're not gonna get broken down. And it also doesn't mean that should you not achieve what you wanted, that you can't, that you're not able to get up again. Um, I'd really like to thank Ngudi um, for being present here today, because I think the presence of leaders in the industry is fundamentally important in affirming our entrepreneurs. I, I would also like to thank her boss, Malcolm, for also coming through, because it just adds to the voice that entrepreneurs, you're not alone. You do need to prepare, you know, you need to understand your story. And when you do so, there is someone on the other side who's willing to listen. And thank you to you, Jeshi. So those are my closing comments. Happy Africa Day to everybody. Thank you so much, Ipileng. And I see Nkuli is back online with us. Nkuli, we lost you for a little bit, but I'll give you a call and make sure I receive your feedback and share that with the rest of the participants as well. Nkuli, closing comments from your side. I want to thank you both for having me. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the attendance as well. I think that the questions have really helped us also in shaping how we respond uh, when, when entrepreneurs approach us. point that I made, be very assertive as an entrepreneur. You know what value you can bring. I think that big conglomerates are not as agile and cannot move and be nimble as much as they need to because they are big machines, right? Right? Therein lies the power of entrepreneurship because you are agile, you are able to respond in a relevant way, in a timely manner. So we need you. Um, half the time we are running these big machines and sometimes we're doing the same thing for, for years and years, you know, without change or if they see opportunity where we don't see it because we are so busy driving big machine. So we do look forward to those solutions that they bring to the table. I think that it's so critical. It is a bit of a shame that our country does not have sufficient landscape of seed funding to enable the entrepreneurial spirit uh, in our country to, to catapult to the next level. But be that as it may, those platforms that do exist, make sure you inform yourself about those opportunities and knock on every single one of those doors. The reality is market to access is actually what will lead you to the next level. And uh, we don't take for granted the, the, the need for that market to access. You can have all the funding in the world if you don't have the market access, uh, then it doesn't help. So I think uh, don't give up. I think that they should continue to understand that the landscape is very broad. It's not limited to a property management services industry uh, alone. Real estate is the right sector for you to be in. So I want that to remain an, a, an encouraging factor for our entrepreneurs. I think that with compliance and transformation uh, being such a big topic, take advantage of that. Approach those entities that have been in the industry dominating for many years that might be 
purely white owned in some instance elaborate and take advantage of the transformation agenda that we have in the country so with that said i do want to thank you ladies very very much uh, and I do look forward to a time when we could meet each other face to face and engage further with these entrepreneurs. All the best to everyone. Thank you and have a happy Africa Day. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nkuli. Thank you so much, Ipeleng. Thank you, participants. Uh, it's been amazing having you online. Thank you for your positive feedback and comments. When the recording is shared, please do share it broadly with fellow entrepreneurs in the space so we can share the knowledge and share your experiences using the hashtag PropreneurX. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram on at PropreneurX and on LinkedIn and stay in touch so that you can also benefit from some of these programs and learnings that we share from time to time. Have a wonderful Africa Day and let's celebrate and let's celebrate each other and let's help grow each other as well. Thank you everyone.